Well, good afternoon and welcome to Agritech, Enhancing Food Security in the United Arab Emirates. My name is Richard Thompson. I am the Editorial Director of MEAT and I will be your moderator and chairman for today's event. This exclusive live stream broadcast um, will look at the challenges of ensuring food security in this region and as part of the sort of the global food challenge. And in particular, we will look at how a new generation of agricultural technology is creating new opportunities to increase food self-sufficiency, to reduce waste, which is a very important issue, uh, and improve sustainability. This broadcast uh, is brought to you by Mead, together with DP World and uh, JAFSA, Jebel Ali Free Zone Authority, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome to deliver today's opening remarks the Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of DP World in the UAE region and the Chief Executive Officer of JAFSA, Mohammed Al Mualim. Welcome, Mohammed. Over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Your Excellency Maryam bint Mohammed Saeed Harb Al Mahiri, Minister of, Minister of State for Food and Water Security. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me an immense pleasure to be with you today here on this webinar with our partners meet to discuss and engage about a very important aspect of our future need, which is really agri-tech enhancing food security in the UAE. Let me start by saying that the food security now has become the most priority thing in our lives. And the evidence of that is that the leadership in the United Arab Emirates have embarked on really a serious way forward to how secure food and water for our populations, our residents and citizens. And therefore, UAE has been very innovative in creating a ministry by itself, a ministry of security uh, for food and water to ensure that we are developing those strategies in place that really makes us or makes UAE to become the hub for the food security innovation going forward. And how to secure supplies of critical items, especially when it comes to food, water, and of course, medicine. When the food security started long way before COVID, and that shows the wisdom of our leadership. But when, when COVID arrived, then we come to know the reality of how important and how critical food security is. Everybody knows that UAE is a desert land. And for you to grow food, really you need two important items. And that is fertile land and water. And unfortunately, both of them are scarce uh, in UAE. And therefore, really to, to, to satisfy the need of our people in UAE, UAE depends on importing food. And today the statistics shows that we are importing between 80 to 90 percent of our food from abroad. And when I say COVID, the challenges that we faced in COVID, it was the issue of the countries going through lockdowns. The countries those that we used to export food from became into a lockdown situation where everything stopped and that has become a real challenge in terms of maintaining a good food supply to the country but again thanks to the wisdom of of the of the leadership and the 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 the, the capabilities that we have uh, in the country that we were able to manage this in a reasonably well that everybody who was living in uae they never experienced that there was a shortage in, uh, in food supply. There is great efforts are being done actually by 
governments in terms of self-sufficiency. Uh, how do we build our own capabilities within UAE when it comes to agriculture, when it comes to uh, you know all aspects of food supply? So there are efforts, and there are we can see some improvement in terms of smaller percentages of growth and self-sufficiency within UAE, but but we have a long way to go uh, in this. And the UAE has a vision, uh, 2051, in place, which is uh, really to make UAE a leading hub of innovation in terms of food security. Of course, one strong advantage that we have in UAE, and in particular in Dubai, that logistically, Dubai is well connected to the rest of the world by sea, when it comes to DP world, which we are there in more than 50 countries, 80 ports around the world, and with all the connectivity in place. And also we have a good air connectivity by Emirates Airline, which connects, which becomes a critical item for uh, food security in this case. Of course, the other strength that we have is Jabza. Jabal Ali Free Zone, we have also what we call a regional, uh, region's operational base for FMB. And we have more than 550 companies, over 70 countries are based in Javza, which helps in terms of uh, food security. But now, finally, we can see, you know, uh, uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. COVID is being further controlled in UAE. With, again, uh, you know, strong leadership in place where vaccination has taken place. Almost all populations who are in UAE now have been vaccinated which hopefully makes the business uh, to open up and we avoid locks, uh, lockdowns. We have seen data and we have seen uh, information where it shows our purchasing index are rising month by month. That means there will be more consumption. And we know, uh, Your Excellency and ladies and gentlemen, that the consumptions in food will continue to grow. And as the economy starts to recover, we expect more population to come to come in within UAE. We will see as other countries are opening up as well. So uh, while they are on vaccination programs, that we will have tourists coming back again. All of this leads to more demand for food uh, for, for in, in, in our economy. And therefore, it is something that we really need to put our efforts together. And especially, uh, I am privileged to be among expertise uh, today on this meeting. Who, would, who we hope, hopefully, we would learn uh, from them and how to manage our food security going forward as well. Your Excellency and ladies and gentlemen, uh, I just want to, at the end, thank our partner, Meet, of selecting this subject, which is really, I think, is now a number one sub subject for all of us, and it's important for all of us. And therefore, uh, really, I wish you a very productive and successful webinar. And I wish you a very good afternoon. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mohammed, for those those remarks. Um, I, I absolutely agree that the, um, the UAE has placed a priority on food security for many years and has been tremendously successful throughout, but particularly in the past 12 months through COVID. And I have to say that DP World and JASA have been really at the heart of that success. So congratulations to you and to your team. And thank you for all of the work that you've been doing, because I think DP World and JASA really are central to that, not just the UAE, but to that regional, uh, that regional story. So congratulations and thank you again for those opening remarks. Um, and it's a delight for me to be working with DP World on today's broadcast as well. Now, so thank you, Mohammed, for those remarks. Now, for the next section of today's broadcast, um, we will be moving to stage two. So if you look on the left-hand side of your screen, you can see a stages icon, a little camera icon with the word stages. If you click on that icon, select stage two, and the next session will feature a keynote address from Her Excellency, Mariam bin Mohammed Saeed Hareb Al Meheri, who is the Minister of State for Food and Water Security in the UAE. And Her Excellency Mariam will be delivering some keynote remarks about UAE policy and policy objectives regarding food security. 
Um, also, immediately after the minister, uh, we will have um, an interview with Henry Gordon-Smith, who is the sustainability, sustainability strategist and CEO of Agritecture, who will be talking about technology trends. So two very important uh, keynote addresses, first from Her Excellency Mariam bint Mohammed Saeed Hareb al Maheri, and then from Henry Gordon-Smith at Agritecture. So go to the stages icon, click on stage two, and the session will be starting in just a moment. I will see you there. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor and a pleasure to be able to take part in today's Agritech Summit, with this year's event especially significant in view of the vital role that Agritech is playing in ensuring our food security during the ongoing pandemic. Thank you to DP World, under the leadership of His Excellency Sultan Ahmed bin Sulayem, for hosting and organizing the Agritech Summit 2021 which takes place at a time when the UAE is weathering one of the greatest challenges it has had to face since the formation of the Union 50 years ago. And as we celebrate our golden jubilee, we should take time to acknowledge the behind-the-scenes mechanisms that have kept food coming to our tables throughout this critical time as we look and plan for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, the past months have truly been an experience filled with lessons learned. Having the political will of our leadership, having a plan, the National Food Security Strategy, and having a strong communication platform, the Emirates Food Security Council, were key elements in maneuvering through the many challenges that came our way. Our National Food Security Strategy served as a roadmap during this time and Agritech being an essential plank of this strategy enabled us to increase our domestic food production while minimizing the use of water, our most precious of all resources. Food security forms a nexus with water security and energy, so it's essential we ensure a balance that is sustainable. Enabling the agtech sector supports our food security agenda by reducing our dependency on the global food chains that are so vulnerable to disruptions created by crises such as the one we are currently experiencing today. In short, Agritech is one of the key drivers to enhance food security. We can see how Agritech is transforming the UAE through the country's growing landscape of controlled environment agriculture, also known as CEAs, in the form of indoor greenhouses, RAS systems, and polytunnels that typically use 95% less water than traditional farms. Local markets, grocery stores, and supermarkets are now able to offer customers high quality grown in the UAE produce, including a number of vegetables, leafy greens, microgreens, herbs, tomatoes, fruits, berries, and fish. Controlled environment agriculture is creating a bountiful harvest all year round without the need for arable land and without the use of chemicals or pesticides. One of our biggest agritech success stories has been the huge growth of our aquaculture sector, which is now helping to meet the UAE's strong demand for seafood. Thanks to aquacultural initiatives that include recycling water, we are now sustainably producing species such as salmon, sea bream, sea bass, hamur, shrimp from the heart of the desert. Each and every one of these achievements has been made possible from the concerted efforts of an array of food security stakeholders. From the establishment of the Agritech Sector Development Team, a body comprising of the public and private sector stakeholders who have examined ways of applying the latest technological means, scientific methods, and policy developments to enhance the overall food security system. From the government departments that developed the accelerator programs that sowed the seeds for a vibrant UAE agritech sector to the entrepreneurs and innovators that have injected fresh ideas to disrupt existing inefficient food ecosystems, to the scientists and agri-technologists that are elevating the UAE as one of the world's leading hubs for innovation-driven food security. Companies operating in the food and beverage sector are among those unsung heroes driving the UAE's ag-tech sector forward. 
They are at the sharp end of creating the innovation-driven food security solutions that are ensuring the supply of safe, sufficient, and nutritious food for the UAE. The private sector is always quick to respond and collaborate, and we are now seeing the fruits of this engagement. Its disruptive qualities shaking up old and inefficient systems and creating versatile, flexible, and more resilient agricultural methods that are the future of food security, not just for the UAE, but for the world. Ladies and gentlemen, this year, the UAE's 50th anniversary is expected to be the year that we hopefully will finally bring the pandemic to a close. Although it's clear that its legacy will linger, this is no time to rest. We need all stakeholders to redouble their efforts and ensure we can successfully navigate any future crises that comes our way. There is still a lot to do while we transform our food systems together to more sustainable ones. I thank all of our partners across every sector of the UAE's food ecosystem for the vital roles that they are playing in ensuring food security for all. I look forward to continuing to work with you as we move into our next 50 years. Thank you all and keep safe. Well, thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, we will now move on to look at some of the important industry and technology trends uh, that will be shaping the food security sector uh, in the years ahead. And I'm delighted to be joined by Henry Gordon Smith, who is the founder and chief executive officer of Agritecture Consulting. Hi, Henry. Great to have you with us today. Uh, I hope that you are well. Great to see you, Richard. Thank you for having me. It's, it's a pleasure. Um, it, perhaps we could just start um, with a little bit, if you can briefly summarize the sort of work that Agritecture Consulting does, um, and particularly in the Middle East region. I know that you do a lot of advisory work out here with both the government and the, uh, the private sector on food security. So perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about this, what you are seeing in the UAE in the Middle East at the moment. Yeah, so my team at Agritecture and I, we started in 2014, and we're very passionate about bringing agriculture closer to consumers in cities. And so we work with a lot of technologies to improve food security by growing food closer to cities. We design the farms, we provide feasibility studies, market studies, and we do due diligence on them to drive strategy for that. In the Middle East, we've had a great pleasure of working on all kinds of vertical farms and greenhouses in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain. We've done some work in Jordan, the UAE, of course, we've been able to work there quite a bit. And so it's been exciting to work across the GCC in the Middle East to see some of the differences and similarities in those challenges. But essentially, agriculture consulting serves to provide data and strategy to guide some of these decisions as we try to move towards food security. Now, as you know, you know, this is a the Middle East is an, an arid water scarce part of the world. It's a desert landscape, you know, agriculture and water security and food security have always been um, uh, very important and difficult and sensitive issues. What has changed? Why, why do you think we are now getting this increased attention? Is it because of climate change? Is it because of what we've seen through COVID? Or is it some, you know, to do with the innovations in the technology side? Yeah, I think that beyond the issues with the lack of arable land and water and climate, um, which is, it's been fine to import that food, but essentially as climate change has gotten worse, these microclimates around the world that are critical to produce certain types of food are at threat and agriculture can't really catch up with that. You add on top of that increasing population, there's a growing demand for quality food. So now the UAE and other countries have to compete on the global stage for trade to get these products. Now, they have the ability to compete with that now with the abundance of hydrocarbons and financing, but in the long term, I think Her Excellency and all the leadership know that there's a need to diversify. If we look at COVID, it's just an example of shocks in the system. So in addition to the long-term threats to food security that's happening and that dependence on imports, you could have a shock like COVID that affects supply chains, and that creates a lack of confidence in the community and the residents themselves, which is certainly not what you want when it comes to food, especially. So it's really a combination of these factors that's making the risk of simply depending upon importing food higher than it's ever been before. So in the UAE, and, and I guess 
most of the Gulf region will be in a similar position. Something like 95% of uh, food comes from imports. You know, it's a, it's a very, very high percentage. Clearly, um, a lot has to change to become more self-sufficient. Where do you see the, the opportunities for the UAE and for other uh, governments and, and markets in this region to become more self-sufficient? Yeah, so whether it's been in Saudi Arabia, the UAE, or any other country in the GCC, the place we really begin with is the talent. If you think about the food system, there's this foundation, which is experience and knowledge. Agriculture is something that takes time to be good at. Technology doesn't solve that problem entirely. So really the best place to start is investing in youth and investing in youth's understanding and vision of how they can be part of the food security solution. If you don't have a society that values agriculture and values farmers, how are you gonna have a food secure future? Everything is gonna be a little bit of a band-aid to get you along the way there, whether it's incentives, free zones, technologies, these are all just band-aids to fix the problem in the short term. But in the long term, you need to really create a society and a culture for this. And look, the UAE isn't alone in this. If you look in the United States, 100 years ago, over 60% of the population was involved in agriculture. Now it's less than 5%. So this is something that's happening globally. We're not valuing farmers in the way we used to. We're not teaching our children that agriculture is a viable livelihood. So we have to transform that. And that begins with training and, and education, especially. But what does that mean? I mean, historically, if you, know, you mentioned America just now. So you have huge tracts of arable farmland. You know, that you don't have that in the Middle East. You've got desert. So farming is something different, you know, whether it's urban farms or vertical farms yeah. or I don't know. You know, so what? these young people, these skills that you're advising that we invest in, what jobs will they be taken into? I mean, will it be software design in agriculture or you know, where are the skills needed? Well, I think one of the key differences now is, is just like you said, with technology, we can do a lot more with less. And so when we think about the jobs in the Middle East, I see it more as a lot of new CEO roles as well, kind of running agricultural companies, using technologies and matching them to grow food in the desert and to adapt. So there's a number of different ways. For example, there's a whole suite of crops that are not popularized in the UAE market. Halophytes, things like um, sea asparagus. There could be a whole business around growing alternative crops that grow on salt water and could be developed and marketed in, into the community. So you could have an, an Emirati, learn about these types of crops, understand the technologies to grow them, build the business case, and work with retail and commercial and marketing partners to deploy that. That would be a meaningful food security solution. But where does it begin? I think it begins with a college, an institution, a training program that helps them think big in that way, helps them find the balance between business, you know, climate challenges, agricultural operations, and technology to develop these ideas for the future. That's how we localize the solutions. That's how we, we help that society be more effective on its own. So I think that technology plays a really critical role in this when it's combined with sort of the practices. And so what agritecture does a lot of is we track sort of the journey of an entrepreneur to become successful in the sector. What are the key things they need to learn? What are the key networks they need to build? What are the key technologies they need to engage in? And we're trying to kind of help governments foster that, including our clients that are developing farms in the UAE or across the region itself. What are the key steps and methods that we teach them first? That's what I mean by the education, the training primarily. And there are ways to do it. I think there's a lot of innovation still coming and there's potential to green the desert with agriculture. And do, I mean, do you have much sight of what uh, training and educational facilities are available in the UAE? Uh, if we focus on the UAE for the moment, what, what's available today for you know, a, a college level education in the agricultural sector? Is there anything? In the UAE specifically, there is, is very little. I, I know Her Excellency is working on this a lot. You've got workshops, you've got specialized events related to this. There's a lot of engagement of youth, but you've got kind of, I think, different things happening. You sort of have some educational institutions that are exploring sustainability and, and much more theoretical applications of agriculture. Then you have some you know, aspects of training on certain farms. It's, I think it's very minimal. And then you have research institutions like ICPA they're developing meaningful research. What I think is needed is, is a more connected, comprehensive approach here. Um, and I'd like to see that embedded into some of the free zones where you have international companies bringing technology and that can be passed on to the Emiratis. So think of like a, almost like a food and agriculture campus where youth have a big part of that 
to provide some of the labor and to make sure that that knowledge being transferred from other countries that may have more experience than the UAE due to their head start on food security. That's sort of the vision that I'm trying to share. But look, a lot of this can happen online. You know, there's ways to do a lot of online commercial classes around this, technology education, business planning classes that are very important for this. Most Emiratis don't see themselves as the farmers. They're gonna see themselves as the farm operators or the farm executives. So I think it's, it's a combination again of, of learning some of the best practices in agriculture and some of the business education that already exists in the region. Now, when, when I think of agri-tech, uh, uh, sorry, agri-tech, um, <laughs> for some reason, I automatically think of vertical farms and, you know, banks of, of these kind of hydroponics growing. But my understanding is that largely that's for sort of leafy greens, lettuces and things. Now, you can't build a whole agricultural sector around that. So where do you see, you know, as an expert, um, where are the sort of key tech opportunities? Is it vertical farms or is it somewhere else? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. So vertical farming is really one of the most high tech forms of growing certain crops indoors. And, and what's great is it, it's, it's really uh, immune to weather and any challenges outside, which is ideal for, for the Emirates itself. But the problem there is it only grows about a, a small selection of crops, uh, which are important for vitamins and nutrition, but not really for the calories you need for food security. So it's really a complement to the system. I'm a big fan of greenhouses. I think greenhouses is an established long-term technology. We can grow a much wider variety of crops. The, the challenge in the UAE with that are, are, are very high to maintain the climates needed in the greenhouse. You can imagine sunlight and humidity going in that affects the, the climate control abilities and increases the cost. But there's innovation that can happen around that, right? There's innovation around using seawater. There's innovation around cooling strategies, shading strategies. And the lines between vertical farming and greenhouses are starting to be blurred by some of the greenhouse, greenhouse operators that we've consulted in, in the Emirates specifically. And that's what's really important to remember is when a society doesn't have a lot of agriculture, beginning to engage in it starts to create this spillover of tech and innovation that creates that foundation where you can find the localized solution that's needed. So we're really just at the beginning. And that's why embracing vertical farming is very important. And that's why also embracing greenhouses and adapting them is very important. But look, long term, the UAE will not be able to produce all of its own food because the climate is going to get tougher, not easier. So it's going to be extremely difficult to do that. But there are other exciting technologies. We're seeing China's doing some interesting work to convert desert land into agriculture. We have seen evidence that you can do a lot more work with, with seawater for outdoor production as well. So I think it's going to be also about adapting the diet. You know, we've, we've created a culture where we buy whatever we want, eat whatever we want, whatever we want. Vertical farming allows that, but again, only for leafy greens and maybe some berries in the future. So I think for some of those other crops that we are used to having at different times a year, we may need to sacrifice that. And there is some soil production that's seasonal that's possible in the Emirates, which is also really promising if we look at Emirates Biofarm. So we shouldn't forget that if we do live a more seasonal lifestyle as far as consumption is concerned, that is another major way to solve food security challenges beyond just trying to grow more food and throwing more tech at the problem. I, I wonder in terms of a sort of strategic response to food security, how much is down to the production side, which you've just talked about, you know, the, the tech, how much is on the consumption side and getting people to sort of consume more balanced, better diets? How much is due to waste on the logistics side? You know, where if you drew a pie chart, where how would it segment up between the sort of the key areas? Well, I think when it comes to the, the UAE, the, the waste category is a really big one. The UAE along with Saudi Arabia are, are at the top of the list with waste from food. So the culture of consumption needs to shift when it comes to food as part of food security. Um, globally, this is an issue. We know we produce enough food to feed everyone. It's a matter of distribution as well. So it's not like we're, we've run out of food globally yet. So you know, we really do need to focus on consumption as a good starting point. And that's the, a more challenging one, right? It's easier to say, hey, let's open up investment and let's grow more food, but not solve the waste problem. But again, I think this is something that the leadership in the UAE is very focused on and trying to make efforts to communicate, you know, eat less, change the culture of waste. Uh, I think there's been a number of events and even um, art exhibits related to this topic to sort of help consumers understand that as well. So I think that that's a really, really important one. Um, 
to tackle waste reduction itself. Very important. Okay. I, if, I, if I was to say, it, it would be as important as increasing production. Okay, thank you. Now, one final question. I want you to sort of gaze into your crystal ball 10 years down the line. Where do you see the UAE GCC food security sector in 10 years? You know, how do you think it's going to change? I think that there is going to be this aspect of these free zones that have been commonly developed for other sectors that are going to evolve to include food and ag tech. And I think that's going to be a very exciting moment. The first few are going to have uh, probably be opened in the next few years, and they're going to have a little bit of a stumbling period as they get used to it because agriculture is different from even other logistics or other solutions. But then after that, I think what will happen is other GCC states will copy. I expect the Ebrets will be first with this, but I think Oman with its new railroad and its strategic access is gonna be very focused on this as well to develop some of these food zones. And if you look internationally, there's really no better place for some of these technologies to be proven than in the Middle East. So there's a lot of international companies that I think are very eager to get involved in these free zones. Um, I, th I think there needs to be a lot more investment in education. My concern is that there'll be an issue in five years from now is as there's more and more farms, the talent is going to be dependent upon importing that talent. And I think that the UAE especially can do a lot to solve that problem in the early days with education. We need to spend the next five years training the next generation of operators. We need to change the culture of that as well to help be more executives and CEOs and leadership because we're gonna have an issue where we have workforce development challenges. In the United States, it's very difficult to find a quality vertical farm operator because there's not that many vertical farmers. So even though the investment is going up, there's actually a lot of issue. A lot of people contact agriculture for recruiting because they can't find that talent or they have to develop really expensive training programs in house. So I suspect we're gonna have a really big increase and then a slowdown because that foundational aspect of talent isn't there. Unfortunately, that's my prediction. Well, Henry Gordon-Smith, founder and chief executive officer of Agritecture Consulting, thank you so much for your time and for those uh, insights uh, into some of the key sort of industry trends uh, affecting the food security sector in the UAE and the GCC. Thank you again. Well, welcome back uh, to the main stage for the uh, Agritech um, enhancing food security in the UAE. Now, for the next hour, we have a live panel discussion with three um, eminent experts from different aspects of the food security uh, sector. And I will introduce the three panelists in just a moment, but this is an opportunity for you, the audience, to engage uh, with the conversation, to get involved, and to submit your own comments or to ask questions of our experts. Now, on the um, right-hand side of your screens, you can see a tab that says stage. And if you want to submit any questions to the panelists or make any uh, comments on the conversation, use the stage tab uh, on the right-hand side of your screen and uh, the questions will come in and the panelists will be able to see them and I will be able to see them and we will uh, we will use them in the conversation. So please, this is a great opportunity. It's a very important topic. Uh, I invite you to get involved uh, in the conversation. Now, so far we've heard some keynote uh, presentations from, uh, from the Minister of Food and Water Security in the UAE, from the Chief Executive and Managing Director of uh, DP World in the UAE region and the Chief Executive Officer of JASA. And we've also heard from Henry Gordon-Smith, who is the founder of Agritecture, a, a, a consultancy specializing in food security and, and agricultural technology. And the main theme throughout has been the growing importance of technology and uh, uh, agricultural technology and data technology to reduce waste, increase efficiency, um, uh, and improve food security. And I think the minister uh, was absolutely on point when she said that the, for the UAE, it's this balance between uh, water consumption and food production. That's the, the food security sits in the balance, the sustainable element between uh, water consumption and food production. And so that's what we're here to talk about in this panel. Now, I'm absolutely delighted. We have a, a wonderful panel of speakers who I will 
now introduce. So Abdullah bin D um, Damithan is the Chief Commercial Officer for DP World in the UAE region. And I will come to Abdullah in a moment to talk about the role of DP World, which is absolutely at the heart of the UAE's uh, food security uh, apparatus. Um, we also have uh, Ralph Neme, who is a senior director from Aero Farms, a, a vertical farming company or an indoor farming company, uh, which has a big presence in the UAE. Uh, and we'll be able to talk to Ralph about the potential of indoor farming in not just in the UAE, but in this region. Um, it, it's clearly a very uh, big opportunity sector for food security. And last but not least, uh, we have Jamal Jury, and Jamal is the Chief Executive Officer for Al Ghurair uh, Resources and Food. Now, Al Ghurair is one of the, the, the great family business names in the UAE and has been around for about 60 years or more probably uh, and involved in the food sector and food security in the UAE throughout that time. Uh, and so um, Jamal is here to talk about his uh, vast experience in food security, but also the role of the private sector in working with government to ensure uh, food security uh, in this market. So that's our panel. Thank you all gentlemen for joining us today. And I do remind everyone in the audience, you can submit your questions using the, uh, the stages tab on the right hand side of your screen. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I'm going to come to you first, uh, Abdullah bin Damithan, the Commercial Officer for DP World in the UAE region. Abdullah, thank you for being with us today. Let's just start with um, the DP World view on food security and particularly on DP World's role in uh, ensuring food security in the UAE. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's really uh, an honor to be here with you. I would like to also uh, to congratulate everybody on uh, the coming Ramadan, hopefully tomorrow. So uh, I think uh, this uh, topic is very, uh, very important and very universal, uh, food security. I think it's everyone is talking about it today, uh, but it is, it is something, that's something new for us. Uh, concern about food security has been always existing since decades, especially for us here in UAE. And I believe Mohammed and Ma'allim uh, have uh, also highlighted that we live in a very harsh uh, climate condition, making it very impossible for us to grow any agriculture product uh, in this part of the world. And also making us highly dependent on import to cater uh, to the internal food uh, demand. Uh, we understand and appreciate that this is a risk for us, especially when there is a disruption. Uh, we could not always be dependent on import. And most importantly, we knew that we had to find ways and means uh, to become more sustainable. And I think uh, Her Excellency, uh, the Minister, have highlighted a few of this. So honestly, our journey really has started uh, almost 40 years ago. Uh, we started uh, and established ourselves as a adopting technology, building a resilient supply chain, and evolving with time. What we wanted to do, basically, to be prepared for the worst. Because disruption, ladies and gentlemen, does not come uh, in one shape or form. You know, it's, 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 it's different, whether it's a natural disaster, a uh, geopolitical issue where we saw trade war uh, between China and US, or the recent one, uh, the pandemic, um, and uh, the loss, the Swiss Canal. All of these uh, challenges are there, and we need to be prepared for them. I remember when the pandemic broke, we saw the food supply chain has been disrupted and how fragile uh, it was and the dependency on, uh, on each other, uh, and especially for us here. The disruption have made a panic among the public where we've seen uh, people are going buying uh, and stocking uh, essential items, which uh, in the news, if you looked at, uh, has resulted in empty shelves in, uh, in the markets. However, this government, UAE government, have always and the leadership have been ready, have been always readiness for any of these uh, challenges and kept the food and supply chain uh, running smoothly because of the planning that they have done. And we, as DP World, we have also played a vital role in contrib contributing to the effort of the government, not only for Dubai and UAE, but also for the region. 
This is because of our investment in our infrastructure capabilities, connecting uh, to more than 150 uh, uh, ports around the world, uh, ensuring that despite all these challenges, the supply chain work smoothly. What we have seen in the pandemic is have only emphasized even more the importance in the areas where we need to more and focus in. And that's basically investing uh, and supporting sustainable and local food uh, production, investing in innovation technology, as mentioned uh, in, uh, by the uh, previous uh, speakers, and also investing in newer uh, and resilient uh, trade models. So Richard, uh, being prepared for the unexpected is very important and building a system that is flexible and adaptable to change in the way we deal going forward. Thank you, Abdullah. If I can just um, ask a little bit about the, the point you made at the end there about um, more uh, resilient and flexible trade models. So I, I don't know enough about you know the, how the logistics industry works, but what does that mean in terms of food security? What, what sort of changes does the food logistics side of your business require? I mean, for us as, as a DP world, we we uh, we try to div div diversify uh, uh, the risk. Uh, it is uh, very important instead, uh, as a government, instead of uh, uh, only focusing on one source or other, but uh, having multiple sources. Um, in terms of uh, uh, continue uh, to adopt uh, and bring in technology, uh, for example, for us in DP World here in Jabal Ali, we did not stop operation during the pandemic. Why? Because of our investment that we have made. Uh, our role was not only as a port operator only, but we have invested also in our logistics capabilities, whether it's uh, uh, land, uh, sea, and even here, uh, by working together close with our partners, uh, providing uh, uh, warehouses, uh, capable warehouses, certified food uh, warehouses, cold and cool store facilities, uh, ensuring that we are able to uh, uh, cater to uh, the demand uh, and have uh, that food security requirement uh, available for uh, for the local market and the regional. So I guess that there are, from what you just said, there are kind of three parts to the, the story. There's the logistics part, and you mentioned the 150 ports around the world that you are connected with. There's the warehousing part, and then there's the F&B production part, which uh, Mohammed mentioned in his keynote remark. Um, do you, does DP World sort of have a strategic um, plan around development of the F&B production or the warehousing or the logistics? How does that work? We have been working with our partners uh, for a long uh, time. And I think Dr. Jamal will mention what we have been doing together with Al-Gharir, uh, for example, uh, as one of our, our uh, partners uh, in many years. Uh, our story started uh, in Mina Rashid uh, when having uh, the first uh, grain silos uh, connected to, to a factory. Uh, the same story uh, continued uh, to, uh, to grow uh, when they have invested in, uh, in also in Jabal Ali with the sugar refinery. Uh, we don't grow sugar in our backyard. Uh, sugar comes uh, all the way from raw material, comes from uh, 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 Brazil, get processed, and uh, being uh, today exported to more than 60 countries. So that ecosystem uh, that comes with it. What we have done and our commitment to uh, the F&B industry, we have uh, launched uh, just uh, a few months ago, uh, 100, uh, 1.5 uh, kilometers of uh, Keyside area for uh, uh, processing, manufacturing, uh, uh, um, for investors, uh, our partners to come and be able to uh, to, uh, to invest in this facility. This gives them a, a key access, uh, direct key access, uh, similar to what uh, being done uh, with uh, other customers, uh, which is uh, very rare and limited today uh, around the region. Uh, so these are our commitment to, to the FNB, plus a dedicated cluster in our free zone uh, area and uh, in our uh, national uh, industrial park, which is located in the local market. Today, uh, Richard, we have more than uh, 550 uh, companies that Mohammed mentioned about uh, operating today from Dubai. Uh, it's not only for the local market, but the wider region uh, up to Indian subcontinent and Africa as well. In addition to that, it's complemented by the 350 logistic company. These companies are specialized companies, which brings value to F&B uh, customers. 
Okay, well, thank you, Abdullah. A great set of uh, 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 keynote remarks about the role of DP World and the strategies. Thank you. If anybody has questions for Abdullah, uh, please use the, um, the stages tab on the right hand side of your screen. I can see that there are some comments and questions coming in, but please feel free to keep them coming. I'm now going to move to Ralph Neme. Uh, now, Ralph, uh, welcome. You are the senior you, director for Aero Farms, and Aero Farms is a leading uh, vertical farmer or indoor farmer. So perhaps you can tell us a little about what you're doing in the UAE because you have some very exciting projects and then a bit about the evolution of indoor farming in the UAE. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Richard. Um, just as, a, as an opening remark, um, it's, it's a real honor to be part of this webinar with the distinguished uh, panelists such as Abdullah and Jamal. Um, as a preamble, I think it's safe to say that food security has, has really become a one of the most pressing issues globally and is even more relevant for the UAE, as um, Hamad al muallim rightly pointed out. Uh, the country imports more than 85% of its food and cultivates only about 5% of its land. Um, we all know that UAE is plagued by the lack of freshwater resources and in fact, the majority of UAE's water supply is from groundwater and desalinated water. Uh, and both resources are um, becoming increasingly scarce and, and costly to produce. Um, but briefly on food security, when we talk about food security, uh, we talk about ways we produce food and, and both topics are intrinsically linked. Um, and unfortunately, we came to the conclusion that traditional models are, are no longer sustainable and we need to figure out how we can feed the world while protecting the environment and achieving economic growth. Um, hence, a new form of agriculture cultivation is required. And I believe in the vertical farming is, is one of the solutions. Now, going forward, um, I believe vertical farming will hold the key to, to sustainably feeding a vast 21st century uh, urban population. Um, and aero farms will play a key role in alleviating the growing uh, food crisis. Uh, we've been pioneering and leading commercial indoor vertical farming, as you rightly pointed out, Richard. Um, and that has been since 2004. Uh, from really from genetics to post-harvest to create a, a much more sustainable approach. Um, so I believe using our technology will allow us to will allow to grow closer to urban populations, um, achieve high yields and, and re reduce water consumption and the use of variable land. So in a nutshell, this means growing more with less. Um, I'm sure we'll cover a lot of these topics during the session and I'll be happy to elaborate further and answer any question. Um, Back to the, the, the question regarding the evolution of indoor farming and the future of indoor farming. Um, we obviously see a huge potential for vertical farming in the region, um, although it's, it's, it's perhaps too early to make any far reaching conclusions on the market success. Um, but before we discuss indoor farming, I'd like to share um, with our audience some interesting numbers um, to help them understand how important the food crisis is today and how vertical farming. Uh, can play a key role, especially in the UAE. Um, by 2050, Richard, the population is expected to increase by 2 billion, so that means growing from 7 to 9 billion. And the food demand is expected to increase by 60%. Um, overall, the food production accounts for 70% of fresh water use, 40% of land use, and 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, traditional models are no longer sustainable, and we need to figure out how we can feed the world differently. Um, and, and indoor vertical farming is, is part of the solution. Now, um, I'd like to talk a bit more about aerophones and how uh, we think will help alleviate the growing food crisis. Um, we're up to 390 times as productive as feed farm, which means we can grow more with less. Um, and our productivity is, is, is high on a small footprint. Um, we use up to 95% less water than regular feed farmers, and that's that's something that uh, Her Excellency Mariam has rightly pointed out earlier during the discussion. Um, and I'd like to remind our audience that global water demand is set to increase by 55% by 2050. Um, the other key point is that we use up to 0.3% of the land of a field farmer. Um, and, and I think we can all agree that access to arable land has become a, a real challenge as the world has lost more than a third of its arable land in the last 40 years. Um, and I think the, the recent global... Uh, the global COVID-19 pandemic has, has really emphasized the, the fragile nature of international food supply chains um, and, and distribution networks. And I think in the near future, uh, we'll see more and more autonomous indoor farms and that are likely to become a key part of a, 
more redundant and um, resilient uh, food security strategy for the UAE. Um, um, now, the good news I is that... Ask you, sorry to interrupt you, Ralph. Just one question. It's, it's very interesting to hear you talking. You know, the, the, I understand the, 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 the point about the smaller footprint, and I also understand, you know, you... By having vertical farms in urban areas, you reduce the logistics element. You increase local self-sufficiency. I'm quite curious, though, about the, um, the crop um, yield or the or the crop diversification. So, there's a my understanding is that you 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 do a lot of leafy greens and microgreens and these sort of things at the moment, but that's right. not going to replace you know um, heavier crops, if that's the right word. You know, how do you see it evolving? You know, the, the sort of diversification of that crop. Well, um, that, that's a good point, Richard, and and, and it, it is true that we we at Aero Farms we, we we're famous for, for growing leafy greens because this is our core uh, core business. Um, but we're also expanding into different crops. We're we've recently expanded into berries, and I'll discuss this a, bo a bit more uh, later during this discussion. Um, but we're 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 able to grow more than a thousand crops. Um, and, and the challenge is to make those uh, commercially viable, um, depending on the, obviously depending on the market, depending on the um, uh, on, on the right timing. Uh, but we're constantly expanding our portfolio um, and looking to uh, to expand into different markets and and and, uh, and product categories. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for that, Ralph. Uh, it's an excellent set of uh, overview remarks, keynote remarks. Um, if anyone has questions for Abdullah or Ralph, or indeed Jamal, um, you can use the stages tab on the right-hand side of your screen, and you'll see Q&A. Under the Q&A button, uh, you can send in your questions. Um, so, Jamal uh, Jury, I would like to come to you now. Thank you very much for your patience. Uh, so, Jamal Jury is the Chief Executive Officer of Al Ghurair Resources and Food. Um, now, Abdullah mentioned the long history of Al Ghurair in food security in the UAE. So perhaps you could talk a little bit about that history. But I'm also interested in the role of the traditional business sector in food security. So we've heard from the minister about national targets and policy, and we've heard from Ralph about tech. Where, where does a company like Al Ghurair fit in this food security puzzle? I think, uh, as you mentioned, yes, good morning, uh, good, after, good afternoon, uh, everybody. I think the, the the relationship that goes back with uh, with uh, brother Abdullah's, you know, on the on the DP world or the ports at the time goes back, you know, long, long, long time. And you know, and today, if you go to to uh, to Bardubay in the site, the big new development with highways, you know, uh, the port is being uh, you know, uh, redeveloped there. That started at that time with the link under under the under the road. Uh, for the pipeline between the grain, the silos to the flour mill. That was at that time, you know. Jabal Ali Port has been an extremely important development uh, for, 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 uh, for, for the economy. And uh, we have, we are the first mover to, one of the first movers to go and build silos there. And since then, we come to the later on to, to the expansion that has occurred. So uh, to, to the question, the role of the private sector, it is the, uh, to really to engage and support the government initiatives in the food security. That's statement number one. And how to convert, how to convert this one into practical uh, uh, steps, you know, part of the Agorair where we have this the motto of enhancing lives, that's the, you know, from day one, is the food processing is a key point into the food security. And I think what DP World are doing and the government doing, creating an area for the food processing to localize the uh, the the, uh, the replace the import, I think it's taking place. Uh, uh, it has hey, um, my camera is not. I think so. You are having the light. Sorry, uh, sorry, Jamal. If you just give me a second, um, Ralph. Did you? I can see your microphone is on mute. Did you want to make a point? No, sorry. That 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 was a mistake. Sorry, sorry, Richard. <laughs> okay, no worries. Uh, okay, sorry, Jamal. If you carry on. Yeah. So, you know, and so with engaging and, you know, uh, supporting all the government initiative in this, in the, in the food security era, era, because we are one of the, the major player in the, in, the, in, the, in the area, not only for the local production, but we have more than the local production and we have 
large scale uh, infrastructure. So addressing those points with the food processing cluster that's being created by 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 by, uh, uh, by the DP World, uh, the Dubai Port, sorry, uh, even though it's the same same organization, the infrastructure. I think that the, the modern infrastructure, starting from the port, basically, right? So you need you need you need uh, an efficient port so that they can bring in large large vessel for the containers or large vessel for the grain, so that you can you know get into the economy of scale and getting your cost of of, of transportation uh, uh, lower. I think this uh, the the role of uh, the, I mean our role as 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 group as I mentioned is the scale and always adequate stocks. We need to, need to carry stocks into the market. We cannot just be uh, a short-term player. We are not here short-term player. We got to, to have a long-term player. Adequate supply chain, adequate shipping, because we don't grow here grain. I mean, what are fantastic uh, initiative they are doing for the product, but you can't grow wheat, you can't grow soybeans. You can, but the cost will be, or, uh, you know, it's not economical to do it, right? So. Uh, and our role also is to avoid in crisis time the sudden, you know, price peak. You know that happens so that because you have the stocks, you can actually get into a gradual movement if there is food crisis. Because you have always stocks in in, in the market here, and always of avoiding your stocks to be dwindled. You don't want to to go with very very short uh, stocks. These are the role of the of the private sector. To engage into the food security, uh, these are as my first reaction, uh, Richard. Okay, thank you very much. And where, do you? I mean, obviously, you cannot reveal any commercial secrets. But do you have? Do you see specific opportunities for investment for you, your own company, but companies like yours? Whether you know, we've heard this morning about technology, for example. Ralph talked about vertical farms. The minister talked about. Um, uh, aqua, uh, aquaculture um, and the need to invest in skills. Is that an area Absolutely. that a company such as yours is looking at? Absolutely. I, I think if you take in the food, in the food, the, the food pyramid or the food plate, you know, you have part of it with carbohydrates. I think the carbohydrates is that we have enough production into into the country here with the, with the, all the capacity existing. What is the short is we have there has never been there has never been a shortage of food but probably a short of production. Let's see, if we take the poultry, I think this is an area that uh, uh, we're driving as a group. Uh, I will put it into the protein sector, be it in the, in the protein, you have the fish, you have the poultry, you have the, the, the red meat. So definitely the group is looking into, into, into an expansion of the localization of, of the production in, in the country here. And this is part of participating in the, answering the food security uh, challenges. Thank you very much, Jamal. Okay, so we've heard from all three of our panelists. Um, I, we've got loads of questions that have come in already. I do invite you all to, to use the tab on the right-hand side of your screen, the Stages tab on the right-hand side of your screen and send in your questions. Um, I'm now going to go through some of the questions uh, for the panelists. Now, um, Ralph, if you can hear me, I, I know we've had some technical uh, problems and I apologize for that. There is a question here. Um, how efficient, how energy efficient is vertical farming versus traditional farming? What is the power consumption required per square meter per day in kilowatt hours? I don't know if you have those numbers to hand, but um, yeah, that seems like quite an important topic. Uh, it's, an, it's an interesting question, Richard. Um, I, I don't have the, the, the number on top of my head, but um, it, it, it is true that vertical farming is, is quite, um, um, high on, I mean, it requires a lot of, you know, energy consumption, uh, but uh, it has to be when, when compared, we need to, to be comparing apples to apples, right? And, um, and if we are comparing energy consumption it has to be compared with, uh, the yields, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're 390 times as productive as field farmers. Um, so that, that means we can grow more with less and, um, and, and, and the energy consumption has to be looked at from that angle as well. Okay, and, and in terms of, um, you know, we, 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 there's this energy transition going on in, in the world at the moment. Um, 
do, do vertical farms do they come with rooftop solar arrays you know so they're self-sufficient or is it not enough of a footprint for that sort of thing um it's it's not the case currently but there's um there are you know projects to um to to use uh, obviously solar panel to make it as energy uh, efficient as possible okay excellent uh, now abdullah if i can come to you i'm interested obviously dp world you, we're talking here today about food security and you've mentioned some very important initiatives uh, around key side length and uh, warehousing but you've got lots of other sectors as well to deal with so for, this is you know food security is a very important sector but it's one of many do, if I if I am an investor in warehouses or food production, are there in government incentives, you know, like to or or DP World incentives to to encourage me to enhance my food security capacity? You know, do, do you do special rates or anything like that? Uh, Richard, uh, definitely, uh, Dubai really have been encouraging more and more investment. Uh, with uh, different uh, incentives, different uh, packaging. But uh, what we can uh, uh, offer here in Dubai and in, uh, in Jabali is basically the efficiency. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Jamal can uh, 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 vouch for this since they've been biggest investors uh, since Mina Rashid and Jabal Ali. And uh, because of the connectivity, as he mentioned, uh, and because of the flexibility, uh, and the investment that we have made in, in, the, in, in the digital uh, uh, area, uh, this is uh, the essence. It's the sustainability uh, and predictability of the cost, which is important. Um, new ideas coming up, uh, like Rob spoke about uh, vertical farming and all of these, they don't require bigger space, but definitely uh, more efficiency in terms of supply chain being able to connect to their customer infrastructure availability. These are the most important, I believe, more than just the incentive of a certain energy costs or rather. Uh, so what we bring to the table, what we bring to our customer is, uh, is, is the, the ability to do with the business. And we like to think of ourselves as a trade enablers. So we enable our customer to uh, reach out to areas where uh, where it is uh, 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 not uh, uh, new to them. Uh, because we are not only present in Dubai, we are present in more than uh, 40 countries around the world. We have 98 terminals. We have uh, our logistic, global logistic capabilities. So all of these uh, things help to support our customer to be able to grow and invest further in uh, Jabal Ali in Dubai. Okay, thank you very much, Abdullah. Uh, now, uh, Ralph, another question for you, and um, I, I think this is very interesting. This is about the future of, say, a company like um, Aero Farms and the diversification of crops. The, the person has asked, um, uh, when the biggest crops like wheat, when will the biggest crops like wheat and barley uh, be ready to grow in vertical systems? Is it possible to do it at a large scale? So I don't know, again, if that's something that you can answer. Well, what's, it's, it's actually a good point, and that's, um, that's also something we look at from a food security angle. Obviously, there's uh, many farms in, in UAE, and, um, and that will uh, definitely help, um, uh, you know, contribute to the food security uh, of, of the country. Now, there is, um, we're, we're exploring uh, barley, we're exploring um, fodder, um, and that's, that's a sort of an ongoing exercise, and we think there's a future for this. Um, and um, and um, um, it's 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 something that we look at very carefully. And how how can we use our technology to uh, to grow this this sort of crops? So the the minister uh, in her comments this morning talked about investment in innovation and R and D and skills. Is that something that you have any involvement with? You know, sort of working with a local university or whatever farms and. Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, we're um, so just just to give some background, we're part of the ACTEC initiative program, uh, which is backed by Adio, uh, which are, and we're, we're currently building a state-of-the-art facility in Abu Dhabi to develop research and development in, in key areas of uh, what the minister has called controlled environment agriculture. Um, so we're looking to grow the company's business around its its core competencies in, in plants, genetics, and technology, and. And uh, our intention is to use this R&D center in Abu Dhabi as a, as a sort of a platform to, to promote collaboration with various partners 
um, including academic partners. Um, so so I, we're, can we're, I just can I just sorry to interrupt uh, uh, right, that? So ADIO is the Abu Dhabi Investment Office. So that's the sort of the pro PP public private partnerships office for Abu Dhabi. You are working with them on a on a hub, a research hub for agri agricultural technology. Is that what you're yeah. saying? That's correct. So we, we're backed by ADIO uh, and we're part of the AgTech Initiative program. Uh, so we're getting grants and rebates, so incentives uh, to build a state-of-the-art facility in Abu Dhabi. And, and this is not going to be a commercial farm. This is going to be a, an R&D center uh, to develop R&D in, in key areas of, of controlled environmental culture. That's and correct. Can, I mean, how, if somebody wants to get involved with that, what sort of R&D is there, are there particular technologies that are being looked at or is it a, a sort of blank canvas? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's very particular technology. So we're looking at this various areas. Um, it, it includes uh, automation, machine learning, machine vision, artificial intelligence. Um, so various areas, broad, broad areas. And we're looking to partner with local universities. Uh, and we, we, we already started discussing with um, lo, um, you know, key local universities on a couple of R&D programs. I was going to put, there's a question here, I was going to put this to Jamal, but I will ask you, Ralph, first, just following on from what you just talked about. The question is asking about, are there plans to improve manufacturing of related applications? So the, the questioner asks about greenhouses, irrigation tubes and systems, cooling systems. Is there any of that included in the ag tech uh, project? Um, well, so we're not a greenhouse. Uh, we're we're you know verti we're a vertical farming company. So sure. um, and we have our own you know specialists, our own engineering team designing and improving the design, uh, the design of, of the fu future farms we're we're planning to build. Um, so okay. we we already have those competencies in house. Um, so those are more traditional uh, systems. Maybe, maybe Jamal, right. um, if, if, do you know of, if there are any plans to sort of improve the manufacturing supply chain side of agriculture in this country? Absolutely. I think, I, I, again, I need to take one step back, you know, the, uh, going back to the, to, uh, to in the, in the ports, you know, the model that we do here, we do like 6,000 containers per month to use. So because of the, the port has, created a big flow of containers coming in we you know with different products inclusive the food so it has created for us a logistic you mentioned about the scale would be for the sugar i'm talking about the the, the crushing plant all our products all our products goes into container into the world market so and, you know that because of when you have an investment in the logistic that uh, with the scale that we have it you can be innovative to for the logistic solution so innovation is part of the of the of the of the thinking process be it on the logistic but be it on the production the, the question you are asking on the on the wheat can you grow the wheat or barley in the market here of course you can will you be competitive i can bet you ralph one dollar you will not beat me so you cannot be competitive so you know but you can do a lot of things which you are currently doing on, on, on this vertical farming, I think definitely that's a lot of innovation there. On the point of the... Of the Sorry, of one, the, one moment, Jamal, yes. just before yeah. you carry on. I can yeah. hear some buzzing coming. Could I ask um, if people can put their microphones on mute for the moment whilst Jamal is talking? I don't know where the buzzing is, but uh, thank you. Uh, Jamal, sorry, if you can carry on. Yeah. So... On the, on the point that uh, uh, Ralph has mentioned, you know, be, be it AI, be it machine, le machine learning, I think in the term of the agri world globally, you know, not only specifically for the uh, for the uh, uh, for the uh, vertical farming, but on the large scale farming, on the large scale farming, the AI and the machine learning has become very important. And starting from the weather all the way to behavior of the, the consumer. So that will help, you know, part of the predicting the, 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 the crop and avoid those big swings or trade volatility because you have been able to have those, those information uh, from this, this machine, yeah. It, just um, relating to sort of the government actions, uh, Jamal, do, over the past 12 months, there have been, you know, the, the, we've seen a focus on food security and uh, the government looking to increase its strategic uh, reserves, you know, capacity to have strategic reserves. 
how does that affect business? Do you are you required to have bigger warehouses now, so you have to invest in new warehouses, or or is that something the government, the ministry does? I think we it's a it's a cooperation between the two. We have over over three hundred thousand tons storage already in Jabal Ali. You know, if you take if you take uh, the country has over over a million ton of storage already, which is a, a great. But you know, and there are further. Uh, initiative by the government to build further storage. The country imports about 2 million ton. So there is enough stocks and rotate the, 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 the grain over, 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 the, 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 over the period of a year. Adding further storage can only enhance the, uh, you know, the, the food security of it on the footprint. But I think the private sector has been uh, forthcoming into investing large scales on a food. That's why. That's why. On on. If I take just one 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 minute, in the on the top peak of the of the of the of the COVID nineteen on the pandemic, March, April, May, you know, some of the people which Abdullah have mentioned, you know, they some started picking from the shelves. We are flour millers. We said we need. We are not. We are not going to allow anyone to benefit or create shortage in the, in the market. So we kept pumping the product into the market because stocks is there. Then people realize that you know, flour into the market. So why should I take it home and store it? So this is the, the resilience of, the, of the, the private sector and the resilience of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, the authorities to allow such, such a reaction to, to such crisis time. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Jamal, for that. And I have to say, you know, well done on to both your company and your whole industry in sort of getting us all through uh, the past 12 months. Uh, it was incredible. Uh, Abdullah, um, I'm just on this experience over the past 12 months. I mean, DP World must have been, and JASA, right at the heart of the storm in terms of keeping the supply lines going, the logistics routes open, and, you know, helping to maintain confidence. What have been the sort of, I guess, the, the key learnings from the past 12 months for DP World and for JAFSA? Well, uh, the key learning for us, uh, uh, definitely uh, we, uh, not only for JAFSA and, and DP World, but for all of us uh, to understand and appreciate uh, 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 how fragile our uh, supply chain is. Um, what uh, uh, need to be uh, done in order uh, to uh, ensure uh, more uh, transparency, uh, predictability, uh, uh, and being prepared uh, uh, for uh, for the worst. Uh, the good thing about DP World and, and, and uh, Jarvis and Dubai in general, uh, we have been investing uh, a lot uh, in the past. Um, and I remember, Richard, a lot of people were saying, do we really need to invest in all of these technologies, whether automating our cranes, whether uh, uh, investing our, in our platform, which is uh, uh, bringing all the relevant stakeholders in one, uh, in one uh, platform uh, for customers to do all their uh, transaction, uh, saving them time and cost. Uh, but a lot of people said, is this really needed at, at, uh, when we started this journey uh, decades uh, in the past, uh, from the 80s, when the pandemic hit, it only assured us that we were doing the right thing, we were on the right track. We were the only port operating. Dubai was the only one of the few cities still operating. Business was still uh, continuing. We had uh, no one of our customers in the free zone stopped operation. Uh, we took safety measures that we require. Um, Customers were able to do all their transaction from their house with a click of a button, do their customer. Uh, uh, Abdullah, on this point about DP World's experience during the pandemic, so there is a question that has come in for you. Um, so uh, similar to what you just said, did DP World face any issues during the pandemic? And particularly, uh, how did you connect with other ports when they were locked down? So you just talked about Dubai being open and functioning, but not everybody was that lucky. So how did that work with your other ports and other countries? Definitely. We, we were working closely with the, with the, the Dubai government, uh, with the authorities. We had meetings with, with all of our uh, partners uh, uh, from the food and beverage industry. 
we all supported each other. With our presence globally uh, in DP World, for example, uh, in India, we managed to basically uh, move few essential items uh, with, uh, required for Dubai from India uh, to cover all the shortages that, uh, that required in the UAE. Uh, because our presence in India and our capabilities, not only in the port side, but we also run our own locomotive, our uh, own warehouses, our own logistics and transportation uh, facilities, we were able to move certain essential products like the rice and the, and the onions uh, that would what to their, uh, their were shortage or requirement for it. Uh, not only in India, but in other parts of the world. So uh, uh, DP World, with this technology, even in other parts of the world, we're able to continue because we did not invest only in Jabal Ali and Dubai, but the same learning that we have here, we exported this to other uh, countries. So we are supported those countries, and as well as we supported Dubai, and our role is not only a local. We are a local operator, but we think as a global. Okay, thank you very much, Abdullah. Uh, now, Ralph, I have a couple of questions for you. The first one relates to the AgTech uh, project that you're working on with, uh, with the Abu Dhabi Investment Office. Which local universities are you working with for the R&D center? Yeah, sorry, Richard. Unfortunately, I cannot respond to this question. Um, I, it, yeah. it's, it's confidential, we're still working on it. Okay, no problem. That's fine. Um, a second question for you, uh, Ralph. Um, do you think the future of food lies in growing more food in as little space as possible? And if so, will the future of food be focused on nutrient-dense superfoods instead of conventional crops? Yeah. Um, so, um, on, on your first question, um, I, I do think that um, for the reason I've highlighted before and during my opening remarks, um, there, there's obviously um, a lack of fresh water resources, especially in UAE. Um, and UAE is only cultivating about 5% of its land um, and imports 85% of its food. So obviously, um, we there is a, an urgent need for this sort of technology. Um, uh, your second question was more about, sorry, it was nutrient dense superfoods, so I guess the uh, protein and stuff like that. Yeah, so this is, um, so I guess you're talking about nutraceuticals and, and the tablets and, and the fluids. Um, oh, perhaps, yes. So, yeah, we know, we know um, um, algae is, is one of the, the, the UAE's um, top priorities. Uh, I understand that algae is could be also used as, um, you know, have different industry applications such as nutraceuticals, um, cosmetics, skin, skincare products. Um, and, and we have a strong interest in algae. And, and um, I can say that it could, I mean, algae can be used also as a protein, uh, as, a, as a supplement. Um, um, so that's that's one of the, one example. And I think this has a lot of potential, um, especially in the UAE since, uh, um, the, the country is trying to diversify the food sources. Can I just one? I don't know if this is a sensitive issue or not, but you know, when you talk about um, producing um, nutraceuticals from algae, we're getting into manufacturing more than agriculture. I think. I, I don't know, where does the line get drawn between farming and manufacturing? So, Richard, we're not only an agricultural company, we're a technical, te technology company. Um, and we're, we're trying to use our, our technology to that really, you know, um, access new products and new markets. Um, so it's, it's, it's rather from a technology service provider rather than an agricultural company. Um, but, but obviously we can partner with, um, with you know, producers uh, and industry leaders um, to make, uh, you know, any project feasible. Okay, Richard, thank can, you. Richard, yes, Jamal. To, yeah, sure. I like, can take this one. You see, on the on the on, basically, what we're talking about the new food frontier, right? So be it the be it the uh, what we call the uh, you know uh, the superfoods, you know the quinoa or some other things, but also you have a new uh, frontier of the food on the protein, for instance. You know, you're talking about the meat. You know, while a lot of work is being done now, you go beyond the meat today is, is, is pea protein based, right? So it's completely different one. This is addressing uh, several concerns, be it the, uh, the meat. Uh, if you take the, uh, the 100 kilo per capita in Europe, 
or in the US, this is exhausting a lot of resources, be it the water, be it, you know, uh, the, the carbon uh, emission, so this one. So there is completely new and uh, new growth today in the world market, you know, we not, you will not replace the, the, the red meat, but it will be participating into, into uh, providing food with taste, with the, for the palate, with the, 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 uh, uh, the same texture, but from a new source. This is because of what Ralph has mentioned in the beginning. We have by 2050, you have about 2 billion more people coming in. If you continue farming the way you do it today and you continue consuming what the US or Europe today, there will be some challenges. If China will reach 100 kilo per capita or in population, it will be an issue. So that's why I think there are ways of uh, looking into new food frontier, which is, has been, I think, the big investment is behind it today. We have funds, large funds being investing into, into this uh, uh, into this area. Into this and what does, if I can ask Jamal, what does that mean for traditional, if I can call you traditional companies? Like, you're, do you anticipate that you will have to invest in the new, uh, the, in the new food frontier? You know, whether it's tech or aquaculture or you know, superfoods. Absolutely, and I, I mean, if I talk in, in terms of Algorir, you know, our business definitely we are in the traditional, you know. The, the 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 uh the flower but all the way to the new food frontier definitely it's one of the and this part of the innovation that you've got to be there and we will be there inshallah and, and would that production happen be able to happen in in the uae and in the middle east or does it have to happen in the sort of traditional farming countries you know with with more arable I land? Mean, uh, <clears throat> if you talk about the the, the uh the, the protein market, you know, in terms of the, uh, yeah. the uh, yeah, for it, it has it can be localized very efficiently. The, through through the, fish, the fish farming, farming yeah, yeah, the fish farming definitely it can be also uh, localized, you know. And I think there is there is there is a case, there is a business case for 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 this for for, for this right. You can, for sure, you can, and can be competitive also. Yeah. Uh, now, Jamal, I have a couple of other questions for you here from the audience. Now, one of them is a little bit strange, I think, um, if I can find it. Um, one of our customers is trying to get in the into the UAE with insect production. Mr. Jury, what would be your advice to this company? So I don't know if you know anything about insect production. Yes, I think Okay, again, the, the insect production is for the protein, is for the protein yeah. source. You know, you know, to create, it's a source of protein. Uh, you have some some works done in different part of the world. In France, one of so we were aware of, of of this one. I think uh, we look into all protein production as far as algorithm is concerned, and all what other sources. I think insect if it makes economic sense, you know. I think the 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 uh, call me. <laughs> okay, so your advice is to call you. That's good advice. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, now, I, I guess uh, I've got a lot of questions here, and they're a bit random in terms of the sequence. But uh, Abdullah, from um, what Jamal just talked about there, this new food frontier, and he touched on localization as well. What does that mean, do you think, for DP World and for JASA? Do you create new zones for new types of food production, or do, I mean, is it too early to have a strategy around that sort of thing? As I mentioned, uh, we have uh, uh, areas where there are a key site areas. Quite, the mom mentioned about uh, fish farming, and this is something that's available in, uh, in Jabal Ali. Uh, this is uh, um, highlighted by Her Excellency as well, where we grow here not only uh, the, uh, the local fish, but also the uh, salmon and uh, the tuna, which is required a very special uh, care. Uh, we also have one of the biggest uh, uh, mushroom uh, problems here uh, in our NIP facilities. Uh, we speak with customers. We have uh, dedicated areas for, uh, for uh, food and beverages, mainly for farming, for vertical farming. This is in our uh, master plan. 
Uh, we do encourage our customer using uh, technologies uh, like been, uh, mentioned by Ralph, uh, anything where they can really uh, uh, make the maximum out of it uh, with these technologies in terms of saving on water or saving on electricity and the likes. So DP, DP World, the jobs that we definitely are excited and very interested to support our customer, whether we do it on a build to suit facility, we build it ourselves for them and they operate it or if they want a, a, a available land and they build uh, their own facilities. So all the options are available uh, with us, uh, Britain. Okay, thank you, Abdullah. Uh, Jamal, just uh, you you can expect a phone call from the person that's interested in the insect farm. We have a message. To, <laughs> so uh, stay, stay by your phone. Um, okay, Ralph, um, I don't know if this is a question. You're getting all the technical questions. So is it currently economically viable to reuse carbon dioxide from an industrial producer uh, to, to reduce carbon footprint and increase yield? Is that, is that one for you? I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's too technical for me, Richard, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, right. does any, so uh, carbon capture, it's perhaps a little bit, um, it's for another webinar, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I yeah, I can talk more about the technology that we use at Aerofarms. Okay, that makes sense. No, no worries. Um, I think this one, maybe Jamal, is there any method that is being implemented to reduce waste of food in the UAE uh, that you're aware of? I know that you don't represent the government, but do you are you aware of any methods to monitor food information and reduce waste? I think there are there are a strong initiatives which has been taking place into different municip municipality in Abu Dhabi or in 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 Dubai, wherein all the food collected is being you know fermented you know for to create uh, some large uh, fertilizer and also use the gas to produce uh, the methane you know to produce energy out of it. So there are definitely there is a drive to uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, uh, to to recycle the the the, the food the food the, the the food waste, but I think uh, uh, one of the issue is probably to cut on the food for waste. I think these are I mean as 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 a society as human being, uh, food should not be thrown. You know, so I think that should start from there. That will address the 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 the, 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 the food security from as an individual. As a person, when you start being behaving, respecting that food, you know that's already will be a lot of. Uh, it's an individual uh, response to participate into the food security. It should start by a person, all the way to the companies. I think these are probably I would just in terms of the the food. Uh, food we, we we waste a lot of food, food 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 unfortunately, you know. So in the Gulf yeah. area, yeah, yeah it's it's uh, the numbers are known and they are huge, and I think it's the uh, sometimes because of the uh, the model of the distribution, you need to remove your product by um, from the shelf life, or sometimes we overstock our fridge. Then when open the fridge, it's already expired. I think these are uh, some of moral questions needs to be addressed by each one of us. You know, that's okay, well, listen, we're into the last five minutes of our discussion, and I want to come around each of the panelists just for some few thoughts on, on how you anticipate your business changing in the next five, ten years in terms of the food security side of things. Uh, perhaps, um, if, perhaps if I start with you, Abdullah, uh, what, what do you think will be the major sort of uh, trends for your company over the next five years in terms of food, whether it's increased warehousing or F&B production or even logistics uh, partnerships? I think for us, we already have uh, put forward our plans. We have shared uh, some of our uh, uh, expansion in terms of uh, making a dedicated area for F&B. Our commitment to them uh, in the sense of uh, support uh, and the likes. But most important, uh, uh, Richard, I believe uh, for us as a part of the uh, supply chain uh, is providing our customer an end-to-end -end solution, uh, supporting them uh, in this building our capabilities. Uh, and most important, also investing. Uh, this pandemic has uh, showed us the importance of technology and how this become an essential tool. 
uh, and will be the biggest derived factor for future trade and future uh, security, not only for food supply value chain, but also for all other industries. So this is where our focus is. This is where we will be uh, putting our uh, effort uh, to ensure that we continue to do this. It will give our trader the benefit of cost saving, efficiency, transparency, all under uh, uh, one roof. Uh, <laughs> so uh, for us, this is this is this is how we see it. This is the way forward for us. In the Very good. Few. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Ralph, how do you? It's quite an interesting question to ask Aero Farms because there's, I can see massive opportunities for diversification, but that's also a big risk. So, how do you see things changing for your company and your industry? So, I agree with Abdullah on the technology point, Richard. I think the influence of technology on the food industry is greater than ever, and uh, and I'm, I will be talking about vertical farming, but vertical farming is. Um, you know, the industry can be described as really shifting into new, a new era, uh, which includes scalability and the introduction of new technologies such as automation or artificial intelligence. Um, some, of the, some of the technologies needed uh, to revolutionize this food system already exist. Uh, I think the challenge is that it's being developed in silos and, and, and sometimes with limited integration. So there's, there's a need to focus on integrating the breakthroughs of this fourth industrial revolution into vertical farming, and that will do think, help. Do you think that has to come from the government? The sort of the government is in a position to connect. No, I, I, I'm talking about the industry specifically, and what we can we can what we can develop in terms of technology to help improve food security. Um, but this technology will 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 help reduce resource resource use, uh, boost yields, improve improve crop resilience. All of this, so for instance, artificial intelligence will help us better understand how to grow plants, how to optimize uh, production processes, uh, connected devices like Internet of Things and sensors make it possible to gather um, vast amounts of data such as humidity, temperature variation, uh, we can, which can be used to optimize many processes. Um, I, I, I can talk a bit more about Air Farms, the technology that we're developing. We have a, an amazing technology platform. Um, we have um, you know, 40, 45 uh, innovators, um, Work class, uh, we have a world class team uh, working on in house developed technology such, such as the aeroponics technology uh, that we use, uh, which allows the plant roots to receive optimal amount of nutrients at the optimal time. Uh, we use our own um, in house developed cloth medium. Um, we also invest in genetics to optimize indoor plant growing. Uh, we use uh, our own uh, LED technology. So, by influencing all the various inputs, such as the air speed, light spectrum, temperature, uh, nutrient mix, genetics, we're able to improve uh, the plant outputs and the farm economics and make this business even more viable in the, in, in, in the that, future. That's in an these incredible amount of research that you're doing or innovation. How much of that is being done in the UAE? And I mean, the, I know that Abu Dhabi and Dubai in particular, they want to get more R&D and IP development in right. this market. Do, do you, are you doing much of that here? Yeah, I mean, the, the uh, a lot of things. Obviously, we're, we're a US-based entity. Uh, we're a US-based company. Uh, um, we uh, we're backed by Adio, as I mentioned earlier, to develop an R&D center. Uh, so there will be a lot of obviously interactions between the R&D center in Abu Dhabi uh, and uh, the US-based uh, company. Um, and we're we're really aiming to develop various R&D programs in in various fields. Um, with local universities and even industry leaders to commercialize uh, R&D achievements. Okay, thank you very much, Ralph. Now we've come we're slightly over time. Jamal, just quickly, how, the same question to you. What's the, what do you expect to happen for, from your company's point of view and your sector's point of view in terms of investment and business in the food security sector? I, I think, as I mentioned, you know, uh, with the modern infrastructure, with the, uh, the increase of the manufacturing uh, being taking place and the and the encouragement of the of the, of the manufacturing uh, of the economy, with the drive into the innovation, and also the focus on the efficiency and cost effectiveness from internally from the company, but also from the environment. You know, when you start getting you know very competitive, with also the drive of uh, few free trade agreement being uh, on the drawing map, you know, for market accesses, 
I think that will drive investment into the country here, that this investment will not only serve the purpose of the food security, but also for the export, uh, you know, like we have uh, done in our crushing plant. And again, what uh, uh, what you have unique uh, position in Jabal Ali, wherein you have all those containers coming into from to here, they need to go back into the Southeast Asia. That can create value out of it instead of going empty. And Abdullah, well, he's happy when he sees the container goes uh, full of product instead of going empty. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Jamal. Thank you to all three of our panelists. We've come to the uh, end of our panel discussion. So, Jamal, Abdullah, and Ralph, thank you for your time. Now, to thank all you. of you who have sent in questions, I, we really appreciate the questions. I've tried my best to get through them all, but there are many that I've not had time for. We will circulate the questions with the panelists and uh, we will um, we'll try and answer them as we go. Um, the platform is going to stay open for another 30 minutes to allow networking. So on the left-hand side of your screen, you can see an icon that's with two hands shaking that says networking. If you go there now, um, you can get involved in speed networking where the platform will connect you with other attendees for a 90 second meeting. And if you, you, know, you introduce yourself and then you can set up a further conversation um, if you want to. So if you click on the networking tab on the uh, right hand, uh, left hand side of your screen, you can do speed networking for the next 30 minutes. But beyond that, uh, thank you very much uh, to all of you for your time today. Thank you to our speakers and thank you very much indeed to DP World and JAFSA for their partnership on this excellent broadcast. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Ramadan Karim.